Welcome to the Bloomberg PL Podcast. I'm Paul Sweeney, along with my co-host, Lisa Abramowitz. Each day, we bring you the most noteworthy and useful interviews for you and your money, whether you're at the grocery store or the trading floor. Find a Bloomberg PL Podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts, as well as at Bloomberg.com. We are broadcasting live from the Build America Mutual offices in downtown New York City at Brookfield Place, a.k.a. the World Financial Center. Uh, we're pleased to be joined by Sean McCarthy, CEO and co-founder of Build America Mutual. Sean, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us to your offices. Tell us about Build America Mutual. What do you guys do and how do you fit into the municipal bond market? <clears throat> thanks, Paul. Thanks, Lisa, for coming. Um, uh, we are the the leading municipal-only bond insurer. So basically, we're a AA rated Uh, insurance company that guarantees the obligations of municipalities who are issuing municipal bonds to finance essential infrastructure. One of the things you think about, they think about the federal issues of raising infrastructure, it's really done at the state and local level. uh, That's where the vast majority, 80% of all municipal bonds and projects are financed at the state and local level. So perhaps 2019 will go down as the year of the municipal bond because the amount of record issuance, record inflows have blown out of the water prior records. I'm trying to understand whether this means more business for you. Yes, I'm sure it does. Or whether fewer people want to insure their bonds because they want the maximum yield and don't see downside. Well, uh, that's a good question. Uh, Two things about that. This is a record year uh, uh, through three quarters. there's been $330 billion worth of municipal bonds issued. Uh, the large driver of that, and that's about 13.5% increase from last year. Um, for, for BAM, we've issued, we've guaranteed $2.6 billion worth of transactions um, this year to date, uh, and that's a 31% increase from last year. So uh, the reason the big driver in the increase in the markets is primarily because municipalities are taking advantage of refinancing opportunities to lower their cost of debt and to, um, in order to do that because rates have uh, been dramatically lower. The thing for BAM that's interesting is that we find investors having an increased demand in, in our product. And why? Because there are a number of issues out there that investors are concerned about, whether it's climate change, cybersecurity, pension fund shortfalls, um, events. Do you insure against flooding? Yes, we do. Uh, in fact, if we've guaranteed a transaction, Venice, Venice, I was Italy? just about to say, are you going <laughs> to insure Venice? Well, as I said, we are muni only yeah. in the United States. All right, all right. <laughs> so I, I, it's interesting because I think when you look at what these risks are, we're guaranteeing those 100 percent. Whether it's a wildfire that's uh, in some area of a transaction that we've done in California, or um, these are all fundamental things that we're guaranteeing timely payment of principal and interest when due on the bonds. Um, when, if, to the investor, so they can sort of sleep tight at night, knowing that the, our AA guarantee stands behind our obligations. So, Sean, I am an avid investor in municipal bonds, but I do it for the tax exemption. Talk to us about the taxable municipal bond market. That seems kind of almost an oxymoron to me. Well, it's it's interesting. So, um, what's happened because interest rates are relatively so low, um, the and because uh, Congress prohibited advanced refundings of municipal bonds. It turns out right now that municipalities can have tremendous savings um, by issuing taxable securities to advance refund the bonds that they used to uh, refinance with tax-exempt bonds, but now they've done it in the taxable market. They're being bought not only in the United States, but it's really a global investment. We see Europe, and uh, Japan, Korea are big investors in municipal bonds at the moment. Yeah, I want to actually explore that thought uh, more. We are broadcasting live from Build America Mutual. We're speaking with the CEO of the company, Sean McCarthy. Sean, when we talk about foreigners coming into the United States, is this positive or is this potentially destabilizing for if there is a shift in the interest rate regime and the uh, commensurate outflows? So I think that uh, right now... Um, the, the world is looking for uh, positive interest rates um, and, and, and good investments. And I think that the municipal bond market offers an opportunity for taxable investors globally to participate in the market. So I'd say that's a good thing because the more demand there is for the bonds, the lower the interest rate, the more savings that those municipalities obtain. So aside from refinancing existing debt, are we seeing in the municipal bond market today – really big issuers like the BART system in San Francisco or the New York MTA? Are we seeing small town USA building roads, bridges, that kind of thing? I think it's across the board. You know, so uh, if we, it's uh, geographically diverse uh, uh, in the, in the third quarter, 
we've uh, worked with 211 uh, communities in 27 different states to help them uh, uh, issue bonds in the market through our guarantee. So I'd say that it's uh, the big issuers are, of course, um, uh, have been participating. But, you know, we've done a tremendous number of school districts and, and uh, throughout the country. In many ways, the essence of your job is risk management and to understand what could go wrong. That's correct. Are you seeing issuances right now out of municipalities that are raising the alarm bells? Well, I'd say that um, that's a good question. There's a number of things that we look at that um, potentially could happen. We hope they never do, but our job is to be um, very intensive, very robust credit analysis on the securities that we guarantee. So as I had mentioned, you look at some of the things that are happening, whether it's the wildfires in California, whether it's pension fund issues that are shortfalls that are affecting the finances of municipalities throughout the country. Um, the, the key to it, though, is that, and we believe this completely, that municipalities where they're issuing bonds for essential projects, whether it's bridges, tunnels, or roads, um, they are doing that in a way that it's important to their community, and their tendency is to want to repay those transactions. One of the programs that we've um, initiated over the past year are, are, is a Green Star. There's a big demand right now um, for uh, an increasing awareness for bonds that are being issued for pure water, uh, uh, clean power. Yeah. And so in the past year, this is a program that we initiated and we follow the international standards. We provide that as a service because we're a mutual insurance company. Yeah. Um, and and that service, we've done $700 million worth of transactions uh, in this past year. Sean McCarthy, thank you so much for having us here and uh, for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Sean McCarthy is Chief Executive Officer of Build America Mutual, where we are broadcasting live. We're broadcasting live from the Build America Mutual offices in downtown New York City. Let's get an update on what's going on in the world of municipal finance. We welcome uh, Scott Richborg, Build America Mutual Head of Public Finance, and Patrick Haskell, Morgan Stanley Head of Public Finance. Pat, let's start with you. Give us a sense. I mean, what Lisa and I know about the municipal bond market is a lot of money is flowing into the municipal bond market. Uh, Rates are at all-time lows. Give us a sense from Morgan Stanley's perspective. How are you guys viewing the municipal bond market right now? So we think, you know, across the risk spectrum, we're late cycle. Um, and Muni's offers a haven in late cycle. Um, you know, people don't know whether it's going to be, you know, the $17 trillion of negative yielding debt that's going to be the next thing to go, whether it's the high yield market, whether it's CLO market or equities. And because of the quality quotient Muni's, um, we think it's a safe place to play. All right. It's a safe pace, place to play. Uh, we are here, though, at Build America Mutual, where they're literally paying and picking up the risk in this late cycle. How worried are you about that, Scott? Well, we're very conservative in our credit underwriting. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think we actually think that municipalities are in fairly good shape. Um, their credit is uh, still benefiting from the rise in property taxes, uh, property values around the country. <clears throat> um, Paul. Yes. Sweeney, <laughs> who's you. paying them all. <laughs> Go on. Yeah, we'll talk about New Jersey specifically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but then how do you square that? I mean, Pat, honestly, if we're in late cycle and you're seeing excess everywhere and you're seeing worker cash going in the mini bond market, how can we be seeing really strong kind of credit fundamentals? For be, the, the reason being is we expect um, the uh, if, if and when there is the next recession, it's going to be led by the corporate balance sheet, not by the consumer. So we expect the consumer to still be still be strong through that. What we think is going to be a shallow uh, dip into next year. That consumer then the, the we can still support strong tax rolls, um, and we think that will actually help where munis are today. And that that's evidence in all the numbers when we look at the tax tax rolls from both states and local governments. Scott, give us an idea of the decision making process for an issuer mm -hmm. to insure their bonds or not insure their bonds. How does that work? So from the issuer perspective, it's a pure savings analysis. They look at what the cost of their bonds would be if they sold without the insurance, and then they uh, compare that to what it would cost if they sold with the insurance less the cost of the insurance. And as long as that is a positive number, and generally it has averaged about 1% of the par for the issuer, they're saving about 1% of the total par using bond insurance, they uh, 
you know, make the economic decision to add the bond insurance and save the money. So what percentage of issuers generally <clears throat> insure their bonds either with you guys or with somebody else? Sure. Of the total issuance, it's just around 6% of the total par that's issued, but around 15 to 17% of the number of issuers. Okay. So obviously we insure a lot of the smaller, lesser known uh, municipal uh, issuers around the country and not the super large state of California, New York cities that all of the institutional big investors around the country are very familiar with. All right, so Pat, you've lived through, you both have lived through the past financial crisis and everything that happened. Today I saw a story about how rents in New York and Boston are coming down. This just is an ongoing trend of cooling in some of the uh, most taxed regions. I'm wondering how that factors into the credit worthiness of some of these bonds if they if people won't be able to pay or, or, or won't be on the hook to pay as much if their apartments are worth half as much. Look, I think it, there's, there's demographic trends that people need to pay attention to, but I don't think it's any any looming disaster. Um, you know, the yes, rents are coming down because capacity has been added in New York City, um, but people are still paying a lot of money for apartments. I mean, I read the paper this morning that Jeffrey Epstein's apartment is going to go for 100 million bucks. I mean, that's Jeffrey <laughs> so, Epstein. Come on, that's not our example. No, of, uh, no, you know, come not, on, the paragon of real but, estate. But my, my point simply is people are not, you know, going in droves. They're not following the president to Florida. Um, so I think New York and Boston are safe. They, they, the rents went to very elevated levels and they're coming off. But I think, again, getting back to, you know, all joking aside, to the trends that we're looking at, if the consumer continues to stay as strong as the consumer has been um, at this late in the cycle, things like, you know, other parts of our market, you know, things like airports will continue to do well, transportation sectors, um, you know, the uh, that we, we tend to like, we like health care, um, a little less so higher ed because of competitive pressures there. So, Pat, are, are you surprised that we're, like, what, I, what I'm hearing about the municipal, uh, municipal bond market in terms of issuance is it's mostly refinancing. Are you surprised that maybe municipalities aren't taking this low interest rate environment to fund more infrastructure, fund more roads and bridges and things like that? Um, you know, on a, as a this is not a Morgan Stanley point of view. As a citizen, yes, but I think that's more of a reflection of the politics that we're dealing with today um, than it is the uh, the absolute uh, you know term structure of rates. Um, if we could get you know both sides to agree on how to implement infrastructure reform, um, yeah, I think people should be you know spending new money on it, not just worried uh, worried about the refinancings. Scott, mm-hmm. a lot of people are predicting that next year the rally in muni bonds will continue mm-hmm. uh, with a number of factors of pushing money into the space. Do you worry or do you hope that municipalities actually use that money to do more and to build more? Sure. We're obviously very pro-infrastructure financing around the country. As Um, long as it's not a bridge to nowhere. (laughs) As long as (laughs) it's not a bridge to nowhere. Um, But I actually think that the capital plans uh, that we're seeing, you know, come out of municipalities around the country are very well thought out some of these plans have been shelved for the last couple of years. They've been waiting for additional revenue so they can fund these projects. Um, And as we all know, the infrastructure across the country is in great need of improvement. We all travel through airports. Almost every airport that I travel through around the country is under some kind of construction um, expansion. Uh, So the biggest challenge for the municipal issuers is their overall budgets are growing, but growing at a relatively slow amount, but they have other costs that are growing, like pension costs, um, cost of services that are outpacing the growth in their overall budget. So it is constraining the amount of their budget that they can dedicate to pay for new infrastructure. And I think that's the biggest challenge from a municipal issuer standpoint is they all want to fund these new projects, but the pie is only so big, and how do they uh, divvy up that pie? So, Pat, 30 seconds. Um, What's Morgan Stanley's view of the municipal bond market in terms of issuance next year? Do you expect the municipal bond market to be active? Uh, We do think it's going to be active. Um, Mike Cezas, who owns that call for us, hasn't come out with it yet. Um, so that'll come out next week. Mike st- does a great job on this stuff. But I think that um, coming out, coming off the trading desk, we're north of $400 billion, um, in our estimate. And I, you know, we'll have the research guys, kind of, like I said, come out when they do. Um, but it's going to be a busy year. Um, I think the you know we've seen 30% of the, the issuance this quarter come in the taxable domain. That's bringing international investors into our market, which I think is exciting for the issuers. It's going to lower their cost of funds, and it's going to be bring co- crossover buyers into credits that didn't exist before. Thank you so much for joining us, Patrick Haskell. Morgan Stanley, Head of Public Finance, as well as Scott Richberg, Build America Mutual Head of Public Finance.
We've been talking a lot today as we broadcast live from the Build America Mutual offices in downtown Manhattan. We've been talking a lot about the flood of cash into municipal debt this year and the uh, commensurate issuance flood that we've seen. The question is, as an investor in the assets, where are there still opportunities given how much spread tightening we've seen? Mark Muller, head of municipal investments at Lowe's Corporation, and Grant Dewey, head of municipal, uh, municipal credit, uh, capital markets, excuse me, at uh, Build America Mutual, joining us here on site. Mark, I want to start with you. Where do you see opportunity at this point? Uh, Thanks, Lisa. So I'm an institutional investor. I represent a property casualty insurance company. So unlike the demand side that we've seen in municipals, significant cash inflows to the market, I would say on the institutional side, we're a little bit less enthused in translating that we don't see as many opportunities. Part of it's in relation to moving from a 35% corporate tax rate to a 21% corporate tax rate. It's not the same for us as it is for that individual investor, in particular the high net worth individual investor. But having said that, there still are some opportunities out there. When you and Paul were speaking with Pat, uh, you referenced the taxable muni market. It's kind of a growing area within our supply. So if we hit $400 billion, which has been the 10-year long-run average of annual supply, that taxable market was less than 10%, probably on the magnitude of 5 to 7. Paul, what is the point of taxable municipal bonds? I mean, the whole point is tax-free, isn't it? I don't get it. Here are the experts. Why, Why do you invest in taxable municipals? Well, from our standpoint, uh, the municipal issuer is a very high-quality credit. So as a fixed-income investor, for our overall portfolio, we're considering treasuries, sovereigns, IG corporates, high-yield, and municipals. To your point, Lisa, it used to be that the munis were very attractive at that 35% corporate tax rate for the Uh, translation, but we'll still be interested in those municipal issuers at a taxable uh, yield, given the high credit quality. So, Grant, uh, at Build America Mutual, I know you guys on the insurance side work with a lot of smaller issuers. Give us a sense of the health of kind of these small towns, smaller issuers. Kind of what are you seeing out there in the marketplace? I think the asset class, you know, continues to be uh, very high quality. So, um, so from a risk standpoint, obviously each credit is different. We're looking at, uh, you know, unfunded pension liabilities, a lot of different, a lot of different areas. But, um, you know, we're also trying to build our presence in the medium to larger size institutions, also. So we're, in, uh, I run the, the business that does secondary market insurance. Okay. So in the primary, obviously. Um, you know, insurance is used when there's an economic benefit. And so in the primary, some of that economic benefit accrues to the issuer. In the secondary, that economic benefit. Explain the secondary market. I understand the primary market where you go to a, a, a small course. town and say, well, you will insure your bond so you can get a better rate. What's the secondary market? So, Paul, that's, um, you know, once a bond has been issued as uninsured and it trades, um, you know, it trades in the market freely, there can be credit changes in um in particular credits over time. So, um, uh, or an investor, um, you know, if a bond gets downgraded, maybe they want to buy protection. So, um, so we do a lot of work on bonds, you know, that have been already issued where the investor wants to uh, buy the insurance. And so if it makes sense, i.e. the cost of the insurance is less uh, than the benefit to the investor then. All right. So, Mark, talking about the secondary market, you know, people talk about the corporate bond market as being a little esoteric with lots of different Q-sips. The municipal bond market makes it look basically like the treasury market or stocks. Uh, You know, all the different Q-sips, all the different issuers, small issues. Given the flood of money coming from overseas investors, how does that factor in to a market that's highly idiosyncratic? So let's put a number on highly idiosyncratic. 50,000 different issuers. That's not right? that, so, that's idiosyncratic. <laughs> uh, that, that counts. You're talking about, uh, from my perspective, we're trying to canvas the entire universe to find the value. 
The international investors a little bit different. Uh, from my understanding, uh, they adhere strictly to conventions. So they want to make sure there's representation in the index. So a lot of the non-index eligible taxable issuance uh, wouldn't be of interest to them. They have very high credit quality standards. So they're flying in a spectrum that's probably double A or higher. So all the A rated and triple B securities in the muni marketplace get left behind. So we do see their presence and it has moved to tighten up credit spreads on the taxables, uh, but it's been to a particular subset of the overall marketplace at this point. We still have the highest yields in the uh, globe. So it, could be foreseeable that you could see uh, credit preferences or credit criteria moving down the spectrum and expanding, uh, particularly given the lack of defaults that have ever been associated with the municipal credit. Grant, just real quick, 20 seconds. Are you seeing more activity in your secondary market as we get 10 years into this recovery? Uh, yes, we are. Um, and uh, again, the focus is on a little bit larger issues um, and increase kind of the liquidity of, uh, of BAM's wrap. Interesting. Mark Muller, head of municipal investments, Lowe's Corporation, and Grant Dewey, head of municipal capital markets at Build American Mutual. Thank you so much for joining us. We are broadcasting live from Build America Mutual in the Financial District in Manhattan. Joining us now, I'm really looking forward to finding out how messed up our cybersecurity <laughs> protections are in our municipalities. Joining us to talk about that is Jonathan Cooch. He's Hector Cybersecurity Expert for Threat Quotient, as well as David McIntyre, Build America Mutual Chief Information Security Officer, which we uh, learned was CISO. Uh, yes, we did. Pronounced as CISO, not anything else. Uh, so, Jonathan, I want to start with you, the idea of of just how big a threat the cybersecurity issue is on financial terms to municipalities. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, the, the ransomware uh, area has really grown to be a billion dollar and billions of dollars business uh, around the world. I mean, there there is business. so much money. Yeah, I mean, the our the people that are going out and doing this look at it as a business. You know, they're investing money in these technologies to go and send out ransomware to other companies, and they're looking to get a return on, on that investment that they put in there. So from their perspective, it is a business. They're they're launching ransomware, and then they're trying to get money back from it. And so it really is bil billions of dollars. As far as how much it would cost for any given municipality really depends on whether they know what they have in their hands or not. Uh, a lot of times, you know, if they find out that it, that it is a city, a municipality, a healthcare facility, something else like that, they will try and draw as much money from that as possible. Uh, they're not going to go for the, you know, five, ten thousand dollars that maybe just an individual user or a small co company might go for. They're going to try and draw as much money out of it as possible. So, Dave, as you kind of look at issuers uh, from the Build America Mutual perspective, what are you finding out there in the marketplace? Are the issuers on the municipal level? up the snuff as it relates to cybersecurity? I think they're getting there. Uh, there's been a lot of attention to this. Um, you know, municipalities really need to learn some basic cyber hygiene. Uh, they need to learn to update their systems. They need to teach people not to click on links and emails. Uh, they need to do good backups, uh, offline backups. Uh, and then uh, they're much safer. You know, as an insurer, we look at short and long-term risks. So there's always a risk that uh, a system could be damaged that would allow uh, a town to pay their debt service on a bond, for instance. Um, and hopefully they'll have insured bonds. And so uh, we would cover that uh, payment. Uh, but there's also long-term uh, financial implications, and it could really impact the cash flows for years to come for a, a city. All right. So, Jonathan, which cities are the worst? As far as not being able to protect yeah. themselves? Well, uh, you know, honestly, a lot of big cities... <laughs> just don't necessarily have the budget to really have a robust All right, IT infrastructure. All right, excuses aside, who's, who's really going to get, gonna get you know, absolutely attacked? Come on. I, I, I would I would expect a lot of cities in California to potentially be targeted. Really? I mean, if, if I were doing it, that's where I would go after. Which cities? Uh, I mean, L.A., San Francisco. I mean, e even though San Francisco has got the big you know, Silicon Valley and everything else like that south of it. So have, I mean, there, have, have there been examples? Give us some examples. I've not really – I wasn't aware of this issue, <laughs> ransomware for cities. I've seen it you know, for yeah. companies and ind individuals. Have there been some examples where a, a major city has been 
Yeah, ba- ba- Baltimore and Atlanta uh, recently, uh, and actually Albany had Albany. A, had a little bit of a, uh, an issue. And are a, these a few weeks are back. these cities are they paying the ransomware or are they? Uh, so Baltimore and Atlanta did not, um, okay. and they're estimating their damages at about fifteen to twenty million dollars uh, from from, and they were offline for periods of, of wow. weeks and, and months at times for certain parts of it. All right, so Dave, from your perspective, do you go in and do you talk to the municipalities and say, hey, you guys, I would attack you if I were a ransomware. Uh, businessman, or and you guys have to do something about it. Or we're going to downgrade you. Yeah, so we're starting to look into uh, cyber readiness as part of our underwriting criteria. I mean, clearly, we need to look at a, a city. We first of all, you know, the, one of the most uh, uh, easy things to look at is have they been attacked before? Um, people that get attacked get attacked again, and they seem not to learn the lessons often. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's certainly becoming part of our underwriting criteria. So what do you, it's, it's interesting, I would think of some of the big cities, like you mentioned San Francisco, I would just assume that they would have the resources to have the defenses, but maybe some of the mid-sized and smaller issuers may not have it. Are you finding that it, it, it that's kind of the fact, or is it just hit or miss? Yeah, so in, in actually June of this year, there were three mid-sized Florida cities, for instance, which were hit. Um, two of them paid the ransom uh, using their insurance. And what's the dollar amount, roughly? I think they paid uh, 400000 one paid, and 600000 the other paid, huh. through their insurance. Yep. So some do it better than others. It's kind of hit or miss. So you guys, I would think from an insurance perspective you really have to go in there and do the due diligence, right? Well, and we have to, or we have to make sure they have insurance themselves. Okay. So, Jonathan, is there a way to protect the cities aside from just telling people, don't be stupid, don't open stuff? <laughs> there is no patch for human stupidity. <laughs> right. Uh, that, so, I was also in a band called There Is No Patch for Human Stupidity <laughs> really? in high school. <laughs> go on. So, uh, I mean, there definitely are. There, there are, uh, as, as he was mentioning, cyber, cyber hygiene best practices out there. O- offline data backups are, are the best thing that, that I can recommend. You know, So that if somebody comes in and, and locks things up on you, that you have a way to be able to bring data back. Uh, offline being the key word there. I have seen instances where people will back it up to, you know, oh, I've got another, I've got my D drive. So you know, I'm just going to back it up there. Charlie from Long Island writing in, uh, are there <laughs> cases where the cities pay the ransom but don't get their data back? Yes. Sure. And, and uh, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, you need to look at is when you pay the, the ransom to get some proof of life, you need to be able to prove that the, uh, the criminals uh, are able to uh, uh, resurrect your data. Yeah, and, and I've Proof also of seen. Life. <laughs> oh wow, we're taking this to a dark yeah. place. But go on. Well, they, they also have situations. Uh, I've worked with many organizations where they'll go and they'll give you a key to decrypt part of your data, uh, but then you got to go back and pay again and pay more. So I had one one client that we worked with that uh, paid out about fifty thousand dollars initially, and it was ramped up all the way until he paid out Wait, two million dollars. What, what data is this? So, what uh, kinds of data? In this case, he was an IT service provider, and it was all of his clients' data. So everything his clients, small businesses, used to operate HR data, financial data, operational data. I mean, you know, it depends what business that that they're in, but all of their information. So just imagine if somebody came in with with Bloomberg and took out, you know, all of your ability to connect up to the internet, to know who it was you were interviewing, all of your notes, all of your schedules, and anything that took to run your uh, to run your radio show, to run your business. If it was all locked up and you had no access to Paul, it, Paul, people would, would look through it. They'd be like, "Oh, there are no scripts." <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, Jonathan, I mean, where are these actors coming from? These ransomware folks? Is it? I'm, I'm thinking state-sponsored North Korea, or is it just some guy in a? No, I, I wouldn't room. necessarily describe it as a, as a guy hiding somewhere. A lot of times, these are groups, but they're, the real popular thing now is ransomware as a service. So, I, as an organization or an individual, will set up a server for you somewhere. Most of them are out of Eastern. Europe. That's been my experience. Uh, But I can set up a server where you basically pay me and I will deliver the ransomware for you. I will wow. send it out to a group of emails, and a lot of the breaches that you hear about, so the Yahoo breach has been really popular, that's a harvesting of email addresses. I don't really care about the passwords. I don't want to get into your Yahoo account. What I want is the email that you'll respond yep. to. Got it. Jonathan Cooch, thanks so much for joining us. Jonathan's a Senior Vice President of Strategy for Threat Quotient, and David McIntyre, Chief Technology Officer for Build America Mutual. Talk about cybersecurity at the municipal level. I didn't even recognize that as a risk. I was just thinking... Can they raise enough taxes to pay back the bonds? No patch for human stupidity. <laughs> That's that, the takeaway that for that the day. That <laughs> really is going to be a T-shirt that you will see me wearing around the office. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Bloomberg p podcast. You can subscribe and listen to interviews at Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast platform you prefer. I'm Paul Sweeney. I'm on Twitter at P.T. Sweeney. I'm Lisa Abramowitz. I'm on Twitter at Lisa Abramowitz 1. Before the podcast, you can always catch us worldwide on Bloomberg Radio.